Okay, so UCAT results are in again, and we're going to talk about what that means for you, what the test results are saying, and how it's going to influence where you apply to medical or dental school. This year, we're going to do it slightly differently. I'm going to show you at the end specific situations where you might want to apply given a certain UCAT score, because I think it's very good to understand the statistics and what's going on. But really, ultimately, all you care about is what should I do? So we're going to go through that and I'm going to show you exactly at the end where we can find that. So let's look at the step test statistics. So I always like to start with the number. People don't look uh, often at how many people have taken the test, but it is actually really significant because this is the highest it's ever been last year. Well, the highest I've ever seen it anyway at 41,354. Now, um, in the last year it was about 39,000, but uh, again, that makes a massive difference. And this is why I always ignore when, you know, the, the papers will come out and say something like, oh, um, drop numbers dropping and all this. This is obviously evidence that this is not true. This is, like I say, the highest I've ever seen it. Now, the reason so many people are taking this test, I'm not exactly sure. I think maybe the removal of abstract reasoning means that more people are just willing to have a go. Uh, maybe there's more interest in the media at the moment. I don't think that that has changed massively, to be honest. But even when there are negative um, stories about the strikes and things like that, it seems to just increase. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Maybe more policy and push towards it and more schools are encouraging people. But yeah, I can't see a really good reason why it's increased. So like I say, I, I always ignore um, any headlines really that say to the contrary until we see this data. So then let's have a look at what you're probably more interested in is the mean score. Now, if you saw me do the predictions, normally I get the predictions pretty spot on. And I said this year was very different. So I said that it was going to be around 60 um, points less than the uh, than the pre preliminary score. So the preliminary average was 1939. So 1939. And this is about, four, about 48. So about 50 points less. So it wasn't, it wasn't a million miles off, but it's not gone down as much as I thought. Now, the reason um, I think this has happened is that I think the average is usually not always the best statistical way to look at things because what I said before is that you're going to have two camps of people. You're going to have the camp of people that can do um, because they have one less thing to focus on, can improve on these, can put more energy into these other three sections and therefore can improve on them. However, you have the other camp of people who really struggle, maybe say, with the verbal reasoning and they're not very good with numbers. And really, no matter how much time you they put into it, unless they understand the right techniques, maybe get a bit of tra training on it or coaching, they are always going to kind of remain there. So the, the gap actually divides a bit more into people who are scoring really highly and then people who are not doing as well. And that is almost like a you know, like a, a wealth divide, like a, uh, it, it kind of just continues to, to get um, more disparate, the, the gap between the two. But what is, is really interesting about this score is that if you take, so I said that it was too simplistic to look at the score from last year, because obviously the test has dropped a section. So we've got a quarter fewer marks up for grabs. Um, I said it was too simplistic to look at last year's average score, which was uh, 2,523, and then um, just times that by 0 0.75. But actually, if you take that number, 2,523, and times it by 0 0.75, it gives, gives you 1,892. So we've gone all around the houses to basically find the exact same score. But... It's still important. Like I say, it's not. That's why looking at averages isn't always necessarily the most effective way to to do this because it's it's more nuanced than that. So let's look at the individual sections now. Verbal reasoning, um, interestingly, has now got the highest score it's ever had. So last year was the highest at two at six hundred and one, and now it's six hundred and two. So again, I think it's because people have just got a bit more time to focus on it. Remember that we had the BMAT that was removed the year before so you know it keeps changing and that's why every time i find myself doing these videos going this year is completely different so the other thing is decision making so this is the one that always fluctuates last year it was 620 now it's 628 it kind of always bounces up and down around these uh, around these numbers it's not a particularly high one not a particularly low one it's a, about standard really then 
the quantitative reasoning has gone up significantly from last time. If I remember, it was 649 last year, but that's still not the highest it's ever been. But again, more time to focus on this. I think people are just uh, quantitative reasoning numbers, is especially something that if you practice it, and again, something that we see on the Future Doc program, when we help people, especially on you know some of these areas, but quantitative reasoning is the one that you can see big jumps when you teach people how to approach it in the right way. So let's move on to the deciles. Now, I'm not going to say too much about it this year because it has changed so much that it's almost a completely different exam. It's a completely different kettle of fish now that we have taken um, that section out. So again, always being in the top two deciles is great. And as I said, I always like to help my students get into the top 5% um, just so that they can uh, really take control of the application. And it turns out that this year, so I predicted 2250 to, to get in the top 5%. Uh, but that was actually, I say only, but the 92nd percentile. Actually, to get into the top 5% uh, this year, you needed 2,320. So um, quite a significant jump. So it does, you know, it really does pose a few questions. And again, the thing to bear in mind is why I focus so much on the number of people taking the test is that if this, you know, we, we look at these deciles and we don't pay any attribu uh, attribution to how many people are in these deciles, right? Because before when you had, let's say, 32,000 back in the day taking this test, you only had 3,000 people in each of these. However, now that you've got 41,000, you've got 4.1 thousand in each of these things. So for the same number of places, you've got a higher number of people in each of these scores. So that's quite an important thing. And I'm going to show you what that means in terms of how you should make decisions based on that data. Now, also, the other thing is SJT. SJT is, um, I'd say it's about standard, really. Kind of 60% 60 in the top two bands is um, kind of typically what you see throughout the, the previous ones. Let's have a look at the old ones now just to compare. So around anything from around uh, 49 to 66 being the highest in the last few years that we've seen is um, the range that people score for the SJT. So let's look at this year and what does it mean? So I think as more than ever, being in the top two bands matters. And I think with um, it being more fierce with the competition within the UCAT, I think people will start looking more at the whether people have band one versus band two. So obviously it's always great to end up in band one. But I think still, you know, the majority of people are in this, I think really as long as you're in the top two bands, you still should be within a good chance. And um, yeah, there are there are places we can apply with a band three and people that are, and that are accepted with band three. Um, but again, again, this is going to be another thing when we have fewer things to look at just another distinguisher that people might lean on a little bit more in maybe a tie break situation where two applicants are deemed exactly the same and they're trying to distinguish between the two. So look, what, what should you do? And um, I've made a whole new video that we, I'll show you after this where we take queries that we've had from specific situations that we tell them where they should consider applying based on those because that's really useful rather than me just abstracting over this. But practically, what does it mean? The first thing I'll say is if you've not done very well, um, and by not very well, you think you're either struggling to get in or you are, um, you know, you think actually it's probably I've done so badly that I need to start thinking about next year. I would really strongly encourage you to speak to us at the Future Doc program. We're here to go to bat for people and we really are taking ownership of people's application from start to finish. So many people come to us this time of year because they've not done well in the UCAT. They know they're not going to get in. And we then take them to really do well like we can take people who have got a not great score and help improve every other part of the application which is more important than ever this year but also for people who have really struggled we can help them next year come back stronger and do really well and we get so many if you look on the um playlist for our testimonials here on youtube you can see all of the people who have not got in come to us and then we've helped them and we've got them in on you know sometimes they've had like three attempts or more without us so Again, really just an encouragement for, to let us help you. But here's what I would say. The cutoffs for universities, the ones that have cutoffs, these I have no doubt will rise relative to what they were before. Now, I think, again, because we have a three-section exam, 
I think it's going to be difficult, a bit more difficult to predict. But the average was three quarters of the average last year. I imagine the cutoffs will be a little bit higher than three quarters of what they were last year. So, but for the universities, so I would use that as a benchmark for people who specify cutoffs, um, because the X. The ex BMAT universities. So last year, it was the first time that places like Oxford and Cambridge used the BMAT. And so used the UCAT because they dropped the BMAT, is what I mean. Now, Oxford had an average of people who got shortlisted, so people who got invited to interview, they had an average of 3093. And then the average of the people who got made offers was 3131. So if you imagine if we're doing three quarters of that, those are the sort of ballparks that we want to aim for. UCL had a cutoff of 2,800 for um, undergrads and for internationals, it was 3,060. So we need to bear those in mind. And again, we can maybe use the three quarters rule. Um, UCL had contextual offers a little bit lower at 2,600, but these are the kind of ballparks that we're aiming for. We need to think about if we're going for the really competitive universities. The other thing is that I think that comp the ones that have weighted applications, so places like Cardiff, Leicester, if people have good GCSEs, it makes sense to to apply to those. So, but that means that they will be more competitive. So again, this is why it's such a personal thing and why I'm going to make a video on individual circumstances and when to think about it. But like, I want you to reassure you that although the UK is incredibly important, and of course for places that have cutoffs, it's a non-negotiable, right? But it, the application is so much more than just a UCAT score. So it, it's so important to nail every other element, your work experience, your personal statement. Uni selection is probably one of the most important yet overlooked things. And, so, and when I said of these people that we help at FutureDoc, probably one of the most crucial factors for how we get them in is by helping them choose the right universities that are smart. Um, then obviously interviews are so important as well and something that should not be overlooked and once you have submitted your application something that we need to sh shift our focus onto and not underestimate ignore those people who online go something along the lines of oh i only did two weeks of interview prep and i did fine that's what you call survivorship bias the people who did two weeks of prep and bombed and, th and thought oh, i should have done more aren't really going to be shouting about it online but what i'll say is when um, new exams come about when change, big changes happen to the application. It does mean that there's ex, uh, there's confusion, and sometimes people can exploit that because people are scared to apply for certain places, or uh, you know, think that just people think a bit differently and act irrationally. So there is opportunity to exploit that. So look. I'm going to do a video where we go through all of the different scenarios that students have sent to me and where we've recommended. If you would like some help with your application, whether it is to make the best of this application for this year or to go again next year stronger and come back and, and really nail it so that you can get into the university of your choice, check out this video here on the side. But otherwise, best of luck. I hope you found that useful. And of course, any questions we always answer in the chat. So pop them in, in uh, the, the comments box below. All right, thanks, bye.